students i am dr shreyushi datto i welcome you to the e learning center of balurkat mahila mahavidyalaya i am here to talk about william contreve and his way of the world so before i and this topic has been selected for my second semester students before i move on to the lecture formally let me uh, provide you with the flow chart of the lecture so my lecture is divided into two segments the first segment is much shorter and it would deal with the life and biography of sir william congreve and some salient features of his play the way of the world the second lecture which will the second section of the lecture which will be of much longer duration will be dealing with the narrative structure of the way of the world so now let's begin William Congreve was born in 1670 in Yorkshire in La in La uh, London. He received his uh, MA degree from the famous Trinity College of Dublin where he uh, became a slightly younger mate to the famous writer Jonathan Swift whose influence in was much felt in the writings of William Congreve. So uh, at some point of his life he wanted to become a he, he wanted to become a law student that is he wanted to pursue his career in law but then his interest in in writing or in becoming a writer supersedes all other interest and by 1692 congreve has already recognized himself of as a re, uh, renowned writer in the circle of the literary people so his first play was out in 1693 even when he was not 23 years of age so you can well understand how talented he is and then his success in the first play that is the old bachelor boost his interest to write for more and in short intervals follows his other works he wrote the double tiller the Uh, love for love the morning bride and finally the spectacular work of art that is the way of the world the way of the world is published in 1700 but a very striking feature here is after 1700 that is after the way of the world is written william congreve did not write any other work of art this this is a kind of uh, this gains some tries to gain some critics tries to gain into this area interest into this area why did william congreve leave his writing at an at a so early age one of the reason the uh, a critic cited is his the last play the way of the world was not received well on stage like his other plays and this disappointed him so much that he left writing forever so william congreve breathed his last in 1729 and was buried in westminster abbey london london now you can you have seen that william congreve is not a very avid writer that is he did not write much in his literary career but whatever he wrote his marvelous presentation of characters or portrayal of characters his selection of themes his presentation of witty dialogues all these come together to make him such an indispensable figure in the history of literary history of english lit literature he is not, uh, not only an indispensable or unforgettable figure but his contribution towards restoration comedy was much of importance so here uh we shall gradually move towards discussing about the salient features of the way of the world so we of the world by now we know it is written in 1700 and it was premiered in the same year in london in march that is the way of the world was premiered in march 1700 in london but it was very unfortunate on the part of the writer that this play did not get its due acclamation uh, that means the due due success from 
both the circle that is from the audience circle as well as from the critics or academicians circle but this play is widely re regarded as the masterpiece in the restoration committee or the epitome of the restoration committee or the magnificent example of the restoration committee this play is dedicated to all of montagu with whom or whose company and conversation made william congreve write such a remarkable piece of work this way of the world is a restoration class drama this means this kind of drama targets a faction of a society so here uh, william congreve through his play the way of the world satirizes the cultivated ethos of the upper class londoners so now about the play very briefly the play is centered on two main characters mirabel and melament the hero and the heroine so they uh, the hero they the whole play re re revolves around these two characters they the crux in one liner the crux is they wanted to get married with each other but with the consent of melamin's aunt that is lady wishfort lady wishfort is a very rich old woman who is holding melamin's fortune and if mirabel marries marries melamin with the consent of the lady wishfort then he will be getting 6000 pounds of melamin's share of the fortune but if this marriage takes place without the consent of lady wishfort this money of melamin's fortune will stay in the control of lady wishfort it will not be transferred to melamin or mirabel so in a way this consent of lady wishfort this whole play moves around the action of mirabel and melamin in their attempt to achieve or to get the consent of lady wishfort now uh, if you remember that at some point of his career his career that is william congreve he developed certain interest in law so the reflection of his interest in law is felt in his play as well the play is imbued with legal jargon marital and financial contracts as the another reason for this is this play is written in the backdrop of the late 17th century after the glorious revolution takes place took place that is in the year 1688 the property law was modified so it is not not only the modification that gained attention from the writer but also this modification uh, gained attention from the bourgeois class so all these factors all these factors tried to come together to bring a front such a remarkable work of art so here ends the first section of my discussion so uh, after that i will try to read into the play the way of the world before i go into analyzing what uh, the play or in focus the focus will be today for today's lecture will will be the narrative structure uh, before i go or before i take up in discussing the narrative structure of the way of the world why not discuss or spare some time about the drama so uh, what is drama what makes up a drama so by this word drama the first word that should come to your mind or the word that comes to my mind is action drama always begets action drama means action drama is never meant to be read drama is always meant to be performed so when it becomes action it has to have some characters it has to have some dialogue and the most important thing is it has to have some stage so i am not going into the theater part but sir but i am here to show you some of the 
basic components of drama what makes up the drama or what, or what are the key ingredients of the drama so the basic components of a drama as you can see is four narrative structure which includes plot and setting dramas should have characters dramas also should have themes and then diction or language for today we shall be focusing only on the first section that is the narrative structure including plot and setting of the way of the world now what is a narrative structure narrative structure is a literary element like other literary elements uh, you have figures of speech allusion euphemism flashbacks sometimes better terms as medias res so narrative structure is such a literary element it is the structural framework this means it forms the skeleton of any work which determines the order and manner in which a narrative is to be presented to a reader listener or viewer now what is the purpose of such presentation the main purpose is to attain the intended meaning by the author this means what the author tries tries to convey to the reader should be conveyed through the ordering of the incidents this narrative text structures include the plot and setting what is plot the plot is the most important part of a drama according to aristotle the famous greek philosopher plot means the arrangement of incidents this incidents one incident should hook upon to the another incident in this way it should form a chain of incidents that means a sequence that should make up other narrative or the story this plot is divided into two in basically this division is basically found in majority of the plays it should have a work should have the main plot and it should have the supporting subplots sometimes these subplots serve as counterplots what would you call a main plot and what line of action would you call as a subplot it's very simple main plot involves the happenings or incidents of the main characters that means whatever the hero or heroine of a play performs or the activity undertaken by the hero and the heroine becomes the part of the main plot and subplots run as a secondary line of action parallel to the main narrative subplot subplot consists of the actions played by the other minor characters so subplots generally forms the pillars of support to the main plots now sometimes these subplots try to complex the action of the main plot here the term counterplot can be introduced so counterplots are a kind of subplots they involve the actions of secondary characters that tends to complicate or impede the main action if we take for example the story from the way of the world the main plot is the action of miramant milamant and mirable the hero and the heroine and the counterplots will be lady wishforts wish to get milamant marry to her nephew so it would who comes from a countryside or mr fainall and mrs marwood's conspiracy to try to get lady wishforts wealth by defaming her daughter so these are some counterplots which try to complex or rather complicate the action of the main plot so in this context that means in the context of the way of the world it is better say to have one main plot of mirable and milament and few counterplots like you have mrs fainor marod you have lady wishford you have the plan of foible and um, sir wilful 
at this point a question that might come to your mind is is there any pattern of arranging the main plot and the subplot or every work is there any stipulated number of subplots or the main plot does a work has to abide these all selections of main plot and subplot and the arrangement by now we know that is the work exclusively is the work of the author but for your better understanding how a work or a drama progresses i am here to introduce you to a dramatic model of gusto freitag this image is called freitag's pyramid this is a dramatic structural model this model is given to us by gusto freitag who was a german novelist and playwright he wrote around mid 19th century and devised this dramatic arc which has five parts it has exposition it has rising action climax falling action and then dinoma please pay attention to the arrow towards the dinoma because this dramatic arc should be read from the exposition so any work of art be it a five act play be it a three act play or a single act play may follow this dramatic structural model now by exposition we mean i mean by exposition gusto freitag meant that characters and crises of in in the work should be made aware to the reader or the viewer then gradually in the as a sequence of events these actions performed by the characters the audience the suspense in the audience will reach its pinnacle in the climax and after that the resolution or the solution or the uh, unraveling of plots should take place in the falling action and finally the solution will come or the dinama will be presented to the reader or the viewer so this is called freitag pyramid our way of the world the text that we are about to discuss in detail we'll see how far this play or this drama by william congreve follows this model dramatic structural model by freitag pyramid by analyzing through the plot of the drama so before we uh, read into the play the way of the world let's have a view of some of the pictures of its performance this image is of the chocolate house chocolate house is a place where the fashionable gentlemen of london would meet around evening and moreover the way of the world opens in this setting so act 1 scene 1 is set in the chocolate house of london next you have an image of mirabel and melament in conversation as so uh, witwood looks on remember melament is the heroine mirabel the hero and sir witwood is lady wishfort's nephew who comes from the countryside and lady wishfort asks melament to marry sir witwood so this image is of lady wishfort and witwell in conversation lady wishfort is a wealthy old widow who has pretensions to beauty and witwell is mirabel's servant who is married to foible uh, she foible is lady wishfort's servant witwell is disguised by mirabel as sir roland with whom lady wishfort falls in love this image is of the proviso scene the proviso scene is the most important scene in the whole of the drama in this scene the hero and the heroine before their marriage they enters into in, into a kind of a marriage contract but this contract has nothing to do with the fortune that milament was about to get after the marriage with with mirabel with lady wishfort's consent so in this scene milament <clears throat> in witty style puts her condition before her lover mirabel 
it appears very funny where mirabel denounces millament the use of corset or the use of excessive makeup or the use of alcohol and on the other hand millament also asks millable not to address her by names like my joy my dear jewel love sweetheart so this scene is also sometimes called as the battle of sexes this is the last scene where mr fainall along with mrs marrot enters with a motive to blackmail lady wishfort and take all the money from him by telling her that if she doesn't give her give mr fainall all the wealth she has he will defame her present wife who is also the daughter of lady wishfort at this point mirabel makes a majestic entry and relieves lady wishfort of all this trouble whereby lady wishfort consents upon the marriage of millament and mirabel so with these images i have tried to show you the characters or to introduce you to the some of the major characters of the way of the world and alongside some of the major scenes that would act as a as a fulcrum around which the plot will unravel itself so you have the proviso scene you have the final scene where uh, the plot gets unraveled and the resolution is presented in front of the readers now uh, and another question so uh, before we go into the reading of the way of the world the plot of the way of the world uh, the question that i will take up and try to answer while i am reading the plot is how far the plot of the way of the world is following the dramatic structural model of freytax pyramid and how this plot alongside changes or reveals the characters as well because my next lecture i will try to focus on the characters so let's begin congreve play and um, the way of the world is a five act play it has a prologue and an epilogue so the prologue sets off the momentum uh, to to the drama and it uh, ends with the epilogue now if you remember the dramatic model uh, dramatic structure of fretax pyramid it the ball sets rolling from exposition here in case of the way of the world the um, uh, act 1 and the prologue tries to present the major characters already introduce the major character and also the crisis it, uh, because the play opens up is set uh, i mean the first act of the play is set in the chocolate house where you where we find uh, mr fainall and mirabel are playing chess now prior to it the prologue has already introduced us to the characters of mirabel and mr fainall and of course another lady who is the daughter of lady Wish lady wishford so the prologue has uh, brought us some base very important happenings or events in the lives of major characters like we know we come to know that arabella's first husband has died and left her his fortune after the demise of arabella's husband arabella enters into a secret affair with memorable and then they ended the affair quite pretty soon and arabella then marries a man who is introduced to us as mr fainall and this man is selected by mirabel to be the husband of arabel so now we try or to we understand that there is something that mirabel is planning but we don't know what he's planning exactly at this point of the play but still arabella here let me mention you arabella here is the daughter of lady wishford who is a very rich woman now 
So by Act 1 and the prologue, we come to know that there is some crisis or there is some uh, plan, con conspiracy being hatched by Mirabel. But this Act 2 will take us to the plot or gradually it will reveal to the readers what happens in the climax. So this way, now, now this is all about Act 1 and Prologue. In Act 2, as I told you, if you, re if, if you remember or if you follow the Fritax pyramid, the model, there you see Act 2, I mean after exposition, the rising action is there. So Act 2 takes control of this uh, point of rising the action. It gradually starts complicating situations. By the end of Act 1 or the beginning of the Act 2, we find other characters being introduced. That means the main plot will follow its action, line of action, whereas the subplots, the characters of the subplots are started, started here to make their entry and try to complex the or try to complicate the action of the uh, main, main plot. Now what happens in this act? This act is set, act two is set at a park in St. James Park where the where we find that Miss Mrs. Fainall and Mrs. Marwood now Arabella henceforth will be termed as Mrs. Fainall because she is the wife the present wife of Mr. Fainall. So Mrs. Fainall and Mrs. Marwood were discussing about their hatred of men in the park. At this point Mr. Fainall appears and accuses Mrs. Marwood of having an affair with Mirabel. And on the other hand, we see that Mrs. Fainall, that is Arabella and Mirabel begin to plot to deceive Lady Wishfort into giving her consent to the marriage of Millamant and Mirabel. This plot, which Mrs. Fainall and Mirabel are talking about or they are planning has already been uh, given to us or already been hinted to us in the prologue or in the act one. So this plan gradually takes, develops itself and tries to pull the suspense of the reader to its climax point. Later at this part, we are also introduced, we are also, we also come to know that Mirabel's servant and Lady Wishford's servant, that is Waitwell and Foible. In Act 1, we knew, we, we knew that Waitwell and Foible, they are married. But in Act 2, we come to know that in uh, Foible and Waitwell, they are a major part of Mirabel's plan. So, Mirabel's, uh, uh, now, what was the plan? Foible and Waitwell, they are, they are servants, they are servant class. And Mirabel's servant, Waitwell, is disguised as Sir Roland, who is Mirabel's non-existent uncle and who tries to woo Lady Wishfort, who is an old lady, but she's very rich. And finally, after she feels dejected by Mirabel's uh, behavior, she consents into accepting Sir Roland at some later point. So now, if I tell you that the ball has started to roll quite, it, 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 it has taken a galloping speed because the actions are building up very quick and is and, and, the, and it has become a page turner where a reader cannot or a viewer cannot you know, hold her, him, his or her suspense to get, to get, get to know how the plot is revealed or what would happen next. Now, if we again go back to the Fritax pyramid model, we, did, we, did, uh, we can uh, remember that there is one vertex in this triangle, that is the climax. So very clearly, Act 3 acts as the climax. Henceforth, Act 3, Act 4 and Act 5, these all the three acts are set into the house of Lady Wishfort. Now, in Act 3 provides the turning point where the high pressure of suspense is built up and the ball
gradually slopes down gradually falls down the slope of the falling action after this act we act 3 opens in the house of lady wishfort and we are seen and that lady wishfort is applying makeup with the help of her attendants now when she was applying makeup mrs marrod makes her entry and she reveals that she has seen foible remember foible is the servant to lady wishfort now mrs marrod uh, they are lady wishfort and mrs marrod they are friends now mrs marrod reveals that uh, she has seen foible talking to mirabel at the park at this lady wishfort becomes infuriated and she calls upon foible to chastise her but the uh, pivotal point here is she did not allow mrs marrod to leave she asks mrs marrod to hide herself in the closet now the situation is mrs marrod is hiding in the closet and foible and uh, lady wishford they are conversing when you see foible with all the wit with all her intelligence knows how to uh, make a situation comfortable in her zone so she somehow avoided that topic of when he uh, uh, how she was uh, when she was talking to mirabel and she avoided this topic to bring in the topic of sir roland, sir roland and lady wishford for for gets totally about it so she leaves after the, after some time in the same scene mrs fainall enters and discusses milamin's conspiracy with foible which remember now in this room there are not only two characters who are conversing foible and mrs fainall they were conversing but they are unaware unaware of mrs marwood's presence in the closet who comes to know of the total plan as miramint mirabel foible witwood they are all planning to they are all hatching this conspiracy at this point mrs marwood becomes very angry but she has a piece of information in her hand that arabella or mrs fainall was having a secret affair before her marriage with mirabel with this piece of information she went to mr fainall and he and mrs marwood mr fainall and mrs marwood hatched a plan or conspired again against lady wishfort now what did they conspire mrs marwood's conspiracy was not to gain financially from lady wishfort but only she wanted to see her friend in a miserable situation and also she never wanted mirabel to become as successful in his plan this was our part in the conspiracy but with this information of secret affair between mirabel and uh, arabella or mrs fainall prior to this marriage mr fainall hatched this conspiracy of blackmailing lady wishfort so he plans to put three terms to lady wishfort in order to blackmail her and if she doesn't abide by these terms mr fainall would make public his wife's actions of transgressing the social code of morality of being a widow she when she entered into a secret affair and then she married again so this a piece of information uh, with this piece of information mr fainall tries to blackmail wishfort against defaming her own daughter into public so this act 3 is very critical because it takes you the takes you to the climax where you see the plot is unraveled or opened up to the readers in a, in a quick conversation between foible and mrs fainall now after if you remember the fretax pyramid the model the dramatic model you find after climax the ball should roll down so the falling action so act 4 efficacy uh, brings out the 
resolution takes the readers towards the resolution. So what did Act 4 develop? They already Act 3 has set the ball rolling because the plots had started revealing itself slowly. And here in Act 4, the plots are totally opened up and uh, readers come to know who are the conspirators. And now at some point, you know, the readers know, but the characters do doesn't know themselves that, for example, Mrs. Marwood was present. And by, by that time, the, re uh, the readers understood that the plot has started revealing because Mrs. Marwood already knew about the conspiracy of Mirabel and Millament. Now... The characters uh, come to know each other that the one who is plotting against whom. This act 4 has a very prominent scene that is called the proviso scene. While I was showing you some images, I also show you, I also showed you the picture of the uh, proviso scene. This proviso scene is a kind of a marriage contract between Milament and Mirabel before they get married. So, uh, and this Act 4, in this Act 4, Lady Wishfort also discloses her wish of marrying of Millament to Sir Wilful or Whitwood who has just arrived from the countryside. He is a nephew to Lady Wishfort. At this, Millament becomes very angry. Now, Act 5 is the resolution or the dinama. So, this last act provides you the solution. 5 is set at Lady Wishfort's house. Here, Lady Wishfort comes to know about the plan of, Mir of Mirable. So, this act gives the solution or the re resolution that has been hinted by the exposition, Act 1 and the prologue and the climax that has sta slowly started unraveling the plot and here the total plot is made bare to the readers as well as to the characters of the play. Now here Mr. Fainall makes a ma majestic entry. He tried to win over all the wealth in uh, all or not win over rather he tries, he tries to take control of all the wealth of Lady Wishfort and he places three demands to Lady Wishfort if she doesn't abide by these three demands his or her daughter that is Arabella's uh, name will be defamed in public so he started black blackmailing Lady Wishfort on the ground that he demanded Millaman's fortune of £6,000. He also wants the remainder of Mrs. Fainall's fortune. And he further insisted that Lady Wishfort's not marrying again because Mr. Fainall wanted to remain to be the sole heir of Lady Wishfort's property. Now at this point, Lady Wishfort was devastated because at one hand she, she wanted the money and because that's the uh, money is the only factor why people were giving much importance to her and on the other hand her daughter was much dear to her so uh, lady wishfort is being seen here torn between the two a love of her mother and the love of the wealth so at this point mirabel the hero of the play indeed this term hero cannot be applied to mirabel that will discuss in the next lecture uh, so uh, the mirable the main character of the play makes an entry and he comes with an evidence which we are all unknown of he comes with an evidence which says that mrs fainall that is arabella even before marrying mr fainall has signed a document that mentions of her fortune to be in Mirabel's control. This means, if you remember the prologue, it was mentioned that Mirabel and Arabella, they were having a secret love affair. But then Mirabel selected a man whom Arabella should marry. So this is a part of the plan and 
Arabella, even before marrying Mr. Fainall, has signed off a document and transferred her fortune in control of Mirabel. Now, Mr. Fainall, when this document was placed in, 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 in front of everybody present on the stage, Mr. Fainall had nothing to do. He has to leave, he has to leave the place tight-lipped. But he, he, he plans or he threats to re return with the vengeance. And Lady Wishford feels relieved. So she consented to the marriage of Milament and Mirabel. So after all this, the plan of Mirabel becomes successful. So we can say in the conclusion that this way of the world presents to the readers the world's way. It projects the world's way, how the way, how the function of the uh, people, how, how people think, how people act. Now, if you as if you see the characters, how they develop, how was their journey throughout the play, in a brief we can say it is only every it is only Mirabel and Milament who attains what they want. Initially, every character is presented as a miserable one if one character if a character has money the he or he or she is would run for love if the character has love then the other then that, that, that character would be running for money so love and money has become an inextricable they are inextricably linked they have become a homogeneous mixture where one is uh, where, where one cannot be separated from the other. So every character, although uh, the journey of a character is a kind of a circle, they, they begin from a point and they end from, uh, at the same point with an exception to Mirabel and Milament who are the only two characters who become successful, who comes out successful in their plan of marrying each other with the consent of Lady Wishfort and it is only them that they attain what they wanted. So this way of the world not only presents to us the contemporary picture of the social world, it also projects or presents a way's world, a way how people, how a faction of a, a group of people of a society was leading, was living the life. So, uh, if you see, uh, okay, here one point needs to be mentioned is about money and uh, love. If you remember Mirabel from the very first, from the very first point, Mirabel is determined to marry Milament. So he is trying every, he is trying every, each and every characters to fix in his plan so that his plans becomes su successful. But why is he making such a plan? He is making such a plan only because it's not to owe Milament because Milament is already in love with Mirabel. But the plan was solely to get Lady Wishford's consent. Without the consent, Milabel, Milament and Mirabel will not be able to get the share of Milament's fortune. So to at the end, it can be said, I would like to quote Edmund Gosse. A famous critic, come writer, come author of the 20th century, he compared William Congreve's this work of art, the way, or way of the world, to the other comedies of the world. He has written, I'm quoting Edmund Cosse, that this way of the world is best written, most dazzling, and intellectually accomplished play, not only in the English literature. Rather, he had stretched its periphery of comparison to all the great comedies of the world. And it and he says, and he said that this way of the world stands out as dazzling as it was in the time it was written. It, 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 it still stands out as one of the remarkable comedies of all time. So here, I end my lecture today. Uh, stay home, stay safe 
and keep visiting the college website. Thank you.